you have your Bibles, turn with me to Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7. We are continuing our walk in Romans. And uh, we will have some breaks here because of uh, things on our schedule. Next week it's Father's Day, and so I'll be speaking to fathers. And then 4th of July, I, I believe it's is it third? the 3rd third of July, we will have a God and Country Day, and you don't want to miss uh, that service. So in between, we'll keep doing uh, some Romans. Romans chapter 7. I want to talk to you today about the inability of the law. Paul, so far in these first six chapters uh, that we are covering and part of chapter 7, he basically is saying, yes, the law is good. The law lets us know that we are sinners. The law points us towards Jesus Christ. But the law cannot save you. That's what the scribes of Pharisees thought. They thought if they kept these laws, they were getting in good with God. And a lot of, and really the main difference is, folks, there's a difference in serving God on the outside and serving God on the inside. The outside is how you perform, how people see you. And sometimes, folks, we can fool others. But there is a person, I'm telling you, you're not going to fool, and that's God. God knows your walk with God. God knows your mind. God knows everything about you. And I, I'm just telling you today should be an encouraging sermon when you see who is speaking and what he is saying. Matter of fact, later on, uh, not in Romans, but in another scripture, he calls himself the chiefest of sinners. Now think of that. We're talking about the Apostle Paul. We are talking about one of the greatest soul winners one of the greatest preachers, one of the greatest missionaries, one of the greatest church planters that ever lived. And he says, I've got a problem with sin. And folks, you are only fooling yourself if you don't think you have a problem with sin. We all have a problem with sin. Psalms chapter 51 verse 5 says, we were born into sin. You don't have to teach a toddler to sin. They will do it on their own. And I can tell you, do the test. Tell them not to do something. Tell a three-year-old not to do something. And I'm telling you, and it's funny to watch them. They look around before they do it. They know what they're doing is wrong, but they do it anyway. But praise God, He saves us from our sin. Praise God, He forgives us of our sin. And Paul here in this writing, I am just telling you, it is amazing scripture. And, and you, I, I want you just to see and, and just rest in the scripture today. Three things I want you to see, the inability of the law. Number one, the law cannot change you. Okay, the law cannot change you. I'll share that with you in just a second. Number two, the law cannot enable you. Okay, the law cannot enable you. And number three, the law cannot set you free. There are people here today that are still under the bondage of the law. They are not free, okay? They worry a lot about a lot, okay? So we have to understand uh, these three things. You know, in the second half of Romans 7 is a real-life example of a person's inner conflict with themselves. And I'm telling you, folks, it's not others. It's not our environment. It's not and you fill in the blank who makes us sin. We are the problem. For me, I am my problem, okay? Because nobody makes me sin, all right? I choose to do that. Part of him pulls in one direction while another part pulls in the exact opposite direction. Because of the use of the word I, which is used 26 times in the Scripture text that we're fixing to read in our Scripture, I believe Paul was talking about himself after he had first found Christ as his personal Lord and Savior. And here's the deal. Just because you get saved doesn't mean you're not tempted. Okay, you will be tempted. Matter of fact, Satan will come after you sometimes right after you are saved. Nobody becomes a mature Christian overnight. Paul was speaking honestly about the battle of saying no to sin that seemed to plague his mind and heart as a new believer. To be truthful, it can still be an issue of life no matter how long you have been saved. 
The battle with sin is real. The battle is intense. The battle is a daily spiritual warfare in our Christian life. Let's look at this wonderful scripture that encourages us of the victory that we can have in Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 7 verse 14. The law cannot change you. For we know, okay, knowing is knowing, folks. We are sure of this, that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal and sold under sin. He also said earlier in our text in chapter 7 that the law is good, that the law is holy. So you can see that there are good things about the law, but it's it, the spiritual part of that folks, is that inner being, that spiritual man. And I know how some people think of it, and I'm kind of dating myself here, but uh, if you remember Flip Wilson, all right, he said there are times in his life that there's a devil sitting on one shoulder and an angel on one shoulder, and they say, do it, no, do it, no, do it, no. And folks, sometimes that struggle is real. It really is. You're sitting there thinking, and folks, the deal about it is if you sit there thinking long enough, you are going to do it. The key is not dwelling on it, okay? Not focusing on the sin. And we will talk about that in our third point. So we know the law is spiritual, but I am carnal. What is carnal? I, even though I am saved, I don't always act like I am saved. A carnal Christian is a Christian that doesn't make good decisions. A Christian that gives in to sin. And folks, this is Paul, the Apostle Paul here. This is what he is talking about. The law, obviously, and if anybody knew the law, it was the Apostle Paul, because, you know, before he got saved, I'm telling you, he, he was a Christian persecutor. He knew the law, okay? He was raised in the law. He enforced the law, but it did not change his life. It did not change his life. Folks, Jesus changed his life when he was on the road to Damascus. So we know that the law is spiritual and we are carnal. Hold your finger there if you would. Go to Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22. Not only Paul had this struggle, but I want you to see Peter had the struggle also. With the carnality with his flesh. Folks, it's still, even after you're saved, you have to deal with your flesh, and you have to deal with sin. And we remember Jesus was arrested just earlier before the, our text in Luke chapter 22. Look at verse 54. And having arrested him, and again, folks, this is Peter, and this is an example of his old nature. He was Peter. He, he uh, even before that, you know, Jesus told him, upon, upon this rock, I'm going to build my church. Not upon Peter, but Peter's confession and profession of faith was in Matthew chapter 16. He was head of the disciples. He was trusted by God. He was on Jesus' uh, inner circle of the big three. And here he is when Jesus is arrested, and look what he does. And having arrested him, Jesus... They led him and brought him to the high priest's house, but Peter followed at a distance. Notice that. He didn't follow close by. He followed at a distance. Now, when they had kindled the fire in the midst of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter was among them. And a certain servant girl, seeing him as he sat by the fire, looked intently at him and said, this man was also with him. But he denied him saying, woman, I do not know him. Earlier, when he, he was with the disciples, and had, you know Jesus was telling them, hey, you're going to be persecuted. I'm telling you, you're going to be persecuted. When I, when I am crucified and all this is going on, I'm telling you, they're going to come after you. And remember what Peter said? Hey, I don't care what the other guys do. I will die for you, Jesus. Well, folks, he's sitting in a courtyard. He's sitting around people he don't really know but yet he denies knowing Jesus Christ. That's that flesh, folks. That's that carnality, that, that coming back in him. And he says, and after a little while, he saw him and he said, you are 
also of them. But Peter said, I am not the second time. And you remember Jesus had told him earlier, hey, Peter, you're going to deny me three times. And Peter said, no, no, there's no chance I'm going to do that. Verse 59, then after about an hour had passed, another confidently affirmed saying, surely this fellow also was with him, for he is a Galilean. But Peter said, man, I do not know what you're saying. The third time, and matter of fact, Matthew's account of this says after that, he swore and he cursed. Okay? Folks, I'm telling you, he, he was going back. All right? He was making bad choices. He wasn't standing up for Jesus. He wilted under pressure. And look at ver the, the next verse. Immediately while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed, and the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Can you imagine? Can you imagine the look on Jesus' face and on Peter's face? Then Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he said to him, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. So Peter went out and wept bitterly. How do you know that carnality was coming up in his life? Remember what happened at his arrest? What did Peter try to do? Well, he cut off a guard's ear. But I believe with all my heart, he was going for the head. He just missed. That carnality, that soldier, that defending. What does the law say? And what does our law say? Thou shalt not murder. And I'm telling you, he aggressively struck a man. Folks, I'm telling you, it takes this long sometimes to lose your testimony. But Jesus, what did he do? He said, Peter, this is not the way we do it. He picks the guy's ear up and puts it back on him. Peter, in rage, I believe, did that. So let me give you the lowdown. Three things he did. First, he lied. He said, I didn't know him. Then he denied Christ. And then he attempted murder. This is Peter. And now, let's look at Paul. Law cannot change you. The law cannot change you. Folks, the law is a spiritual guide, but the law is not the problem. I am the problem. Look at verse 15 back in our text. For what I am doing, I do not understand. Folks, I've done this. I've done something, and I said to myself, what? Why did you do that? Why did you say that? And I fill in the blank in my head sometimes, okay? You're a knucklehead. You're an idiot. I call myself an idiot at times because that was so dumb what you do. I'm talking about me so I can talk like this, all right? I'm not talking about you, okay? Because people ask me, you have a lot of good sheep, don't you? But do you have some bad ones too? <laughs> and you know what I tell them? Yes, I do, and I'm one of them. Folks, nobody's perfect. Nobody does the right thing every time. If you tell me that, I will call you a liar to your face. Okay? We all sin. Paul, this is his words. He said, but what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do, I do not practice. I want to do right, but I don't always do right. Paul struggling with this in his Christian life. And I believe it was early in his Christian walk. And it says, but what I hate, that I do. We can say, I hate it. And we can preach against it, and we can tell everybody else not to do it. But sometimes we sneak around and do it ourselves. If then I do what I, if I do what I will not to do, I agree with the law that it is good. But now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. You did not get rid of your sin nature. Someone asked me one time, Preacher, when, when do we get rid of it, man? I get tired of fighting it all the time. Let me tell you when. When you take your last breath on earth, you will sin no more. Sin is always going to be around us. Temptation is always going to be around us. That's why we have to be on guard. That's why we have to recognize this. We have to recognize this. Look at verse 18. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing uh, good dwells. 
For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good, I do not find. I know the answer. I know the answer. Sometimes even before it happens, but I find myself giving the wrong answer or doing the wrong thing. Verse 19, for the good that I will to do, I do not, but the evil uh, I will not to do, I practice. Notice how he keeps saying, I, 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 I have a problem. And folks, we all have the same problem. It's called a sin nature, okay, a sin nature. I wished, I, I mean, I, I think sometimes people think some preachers, they wake up and they kind of just fly into their spiritual pants. They just start their day with four hours of prayer. They just, I, I mean, you know, and folks, I'm just telling you, I want to be a spiritual man. I do my best to be a spiritual man. I read the Word. I pray. But it, I'm just telling you, there's still times that I fight my own flesh. And I've got a suspicion that if I and Paul, if we're fighting it, you're fighting it too. So we have to understand you're not alone in this battle. It is all spiritual warfare. He will start it right as soon as you get up. What happened yesterday? Well, I was having a good day till I fell out of bed. Well, I was having a good day till I walk out and, and I look at my driveway and I got a flat tire. Well, I was having a good day till I, and you can go through there, folks. Listen to me. You determine what kind of day you have. No one else does. And Paul is just saying, evil is always present with me. Folks, I'm telling you, I can sense evil when it's in the room. I can sense it. It's hard for me even to watch TV sometimes. Because even in news and reporting, it is just pure evil what is going on in today's world. So Paul is saying, listen, you are no different than I. I have struggled with this. And then it says, verse 20, now if I do uh, what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. And again, folks, the problem is with sin. We all have a sin problem. And the sooner you admit that, it's not just saying, and, and we shouldn't have this flippant attitude, well, I'm going to sin anyway, so I might as well do it. That's not what Paul is talking about. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm saying if you, you will not change if you can't recognize it. And as a child of God, you have the Spirit of God inside of you. You should be able to recognize sin when it happens. And we need to avoid sin with all of our hearts. Verse 21, I find then a law that evil is present with me, but one who wills to do good. And he's just saying there's evil all around us, folks. We live in an evil world. And the law is our spiritual guide. The law helps us identify sin. But it does not change us. The law does not change us. And the law uh, is not, the law also cannot enable you. What do you mean enable you? It cannot enable you to be a spiritual woman or man. You have to make that choice. You have to say no to sin and yes to Jesus Christ. Another text of Paul, hold your finger there and go with me to Philippians. Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. Matter of fact, in the earlier, we don't have time to go there, but if you're looking where Paul came from, in those first few verses, he tells you he was circumcised, all right, in the law. He was eighth day of the stock. He was a tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrew. He was a Pharisee. He knew the law front and back, but yet he knew the law could not save him and the law could not make him be a spiritual man. Now look down, if you would, in verse 12 with me. Not that I have already attained or I am already 
perfect. Paul, later on in the book of Philippians, he was writing that from a jail cell, folks. He was arrested for preaching and teaching in the name of Jesus. A lot of years had gone uh, under him and, and a lot of years he had behind him. And he was still saying, I'm not perfect. Nobody's perfect. But let me tell you this, folks. We as Christians still need to strive for perfection. We need to strive for it. I understand it's not obtainable. We already messed that up. But some of us set the bar too low. And i tell you what else we do. We compare ourselves to others. And you should never do that, folks. We should compare ourselves to Jesus Christ and then we will look at it not looking at a person, but looking at our own life, realizing we have a long ways to go. But Paul says, hey, nobody's perfect, but I press on, okay? Folks, don't give up. Don't give in to sin. Don't say, I can't do it. I, I do not like that phrase, I can't do something. Okay, that's the devil's phrase. Why? Because... What does the Bible say? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You can do it. You cannot do it on your own. You cannot do it in your flesh. But you have to go to that spiritual man. You have to go to that inner being. You have to go to the Holy Spirit. You have to bathe it in prayer. You have to go to the Word of God. All these things help you make good spiritual things decisions. But I press on that, my, that I may lay hold for, of uh, that for which Jesus Christ has also laid hold of me. Folks, he lived 33 years of perfection. I think that's the leader we need to follow. He did it perfectly. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. And here's where we mess up. We dwell on the past. We dwell on the past. Folks, the past is done. It's over. What happened yesterday is over. You can't change what happened yesterday. And I'm telling you, uh, if I come up to something, someone or I hear someone or I'm talking to somebody and they say this word. My nickname in, in high school was taco, okay? I won a taco eating contest with all the baseball players. So when I think about that, I think, wait a minute, that's not my name anymore, okay? My name is Michael, okay? And so many times the devil and people around you want to keep bringing up the past. Folks, don't let them do it. When you got saved, your, your sins were erased as far as the east is from the west. God forgave you of that sin. And sometimes when we sin, that's a tool that the devil used. Oh, you call yourself a Christian? Oh, there you went and did it again. And he just nags on us and nags on us and nags on us to where we almost give up at times. And Paul is saying, hey, forget the past. You can't change anything about your past. That's what I love about being a Christian, folks. Every day is a new day. Every day is a new beginning. Maybe I blew it yesterday. And we don't take sin lightly, but we confess our sins. And the Bible says He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And some people cannot get victory over sin because they're living in the past. You're talking about, I call them B.C. years. Before Christ, I did that, but I'm not doing it now. Now look what he says in verse 14. I press. Folks, I'm telling you, press. It takes work. You have to press. Basketball is called full court pressure. Full court pressure. I press. I work hard. In football, it's called two-a-days. You work your tail off in August so that you can be in a championship game in November. I press to the goal for the prize of the upward calling of God in Christ Jesus. And I know the ultimate prize is heaven. I understand that. But do you know what he's talking about? He's talking about your walk with the Lord. 
your walk with the Lord. You're already, your name was written in the Lamb's Book of Life. You've already got heaven. Nobody can take that away from you. What's he talking about? He's talking about holiness. You be holy while you are here. You do the right thing. You say the right thing. You be a witness. You be a testimony. And again, we're not perfect. We're not perfect. But folks, we should strive for that. And that is so important. The law cannot make you a spiritual person. And folks, the battles is three things. Three things. And you need to write these three down. Number one, the battle's in the mind. It is in the mind. It starts in the mind. Okay, the battle starts in the mind. He's already got your heart. Jesus is there. He cannot take that away. The Holy Spirit is always with you, but it'll start with a thought process. Then it goes to the will. Paul here is saying, I will to do right. All right? But folks, our will has to be surrendered to His will. Not my will. Jesus Himself quoted that. Not my will, but thine be done. It starts in the head. It goes to your will. And you need to follow Jesus. Surrender all. Ask yourself, what would Jesus do? And the third thing is your body. Okay? Your body is neutral. But Satan uses your body for bad and Jesus and God uses your body for good. And there's that natural progression. And that's what Paul is saying here. I want to do right. I want to do right. But these three things plague me. Okay, they plague me. My mind, my mind's not always where it needs to be. My will isn't strong enough. And it's not just intestinal fortitude, folks. It's turning your will over to God. Total surrender would be the best way to put it. And then you have to guard your body. You have to guard your body. So we see the law cannot change you. The law cannot enable you. And number three, the law cannot set you free. The law cannot set you free. Listen to me, folks. Only Jesus can set you free. Only Jesus. Look at verse 22. For I delight in the law of God according to the inner man. Folks, I cannot tell you how important you reading the Bible every day is. That'd be like going to a doctor uh, when you're sick and he gives you a prescription and just said, and, they, and when you get a prescription, they give you this sheet that has 96 things that this medicine does to you. Okay? That's like saying, I'm not going to take that. Why? Because I don't want to read that. I don't want to read all that. Okay? Folks, the Word of God needs to be engrafted into our minds and into our hearts. Matter of fact, Psalms, Psalm 1. Go with me to Psalm 1. Psalm 1. The Bible said, Blessed is the man. Blessed means happy. Who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. Folks, you can't hang around ungodly folks and expect to be godly. It's like hanging around with a skunk. You hang around with a skunk long enough, you're going to stink. All right? And I understand. We need to befriend them. We, We need to witness to them. But we can't have that bombardment every day of our lives, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scornful. you got to watch who you're with, folks. They have a huge influence on you. And I understand you can have a huge influence on them. But if you're not spiritually strong, this could be a weakness. Look at verse 2. But but his delight is in the law of the Lord. Folks, we have to read the Word of God. We have to study the Word of God. We have to meditate upon Scripture. And it's almost like the more Scripture you get in your head and heart, the more it pushes out those evil thoughts and those temptations. Matter of fact, he gives you uh, great advice in this, but his delight is in the law, and in the law he meditates day and night. Some of you, it's a struggle to read the Bible once a day. But the psalmist gives you a hint on how to have victory over sin. You start your day in the Word of God and you end your day 
in the Word of God. You start it and things happen better and you won't react as much to what the world and the devil throws at you. And the reason you do it at the end of the day, you do it so that you can renew that mind. Then you can, that you can get that holiness and those good thoughts in your head. Those are so important. And in his law, he meditates day and night, and he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season. And folks, any tree right next to a river or a creek, I'm telling you, it will thrive. Whose leaf shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. You want to be prosperous? You want victory over sin? You spend time in the Word of God. You spend time. Folks, I'm all for podcasts. I'm all for devotions. But nothing can take the place of God's holy Word. Nothing. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. Verse 22. But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind. There's He's talking about it. And bringing me into the captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. He's saying, hey, you, you have to be a spiritual man. You have to get in the law of God. You have to pray. You have to meditate on Scripture. And even when you do that, that doesn't take away temptation. Satan's not going to give up. You just can't give him fuel for the fire. Matter of fact, 2 Corinthians 10. Go with me there. Talking about temptation. 2 Corinthians 10. Verse 3, for though we walk in the flesh, this is my flesh, you're looking at me, I, this is my flesh, flesh and body. We do not war according to the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. There's that word again. Folks, you, let, me, let me just say this, this is, and we're going to cover this, is why I'm not doing it here. We're going to cover it in chapter 8. Folks, everything is either, either spiritual or it's carnal. Everything in your life, it's either spiritual or it's not spiritual, and you can, or it's flesh. You can just fill in the blank with the others. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds. You know what a stronghold is? It is a bad habit in your life. Okay? Folks, I'm telling you, you have to admit it. First thing is admit it. And folks, I'm for the step, 12 step program. Okay, I'm for any addiction thing that you can do. But the deal is, we have to uh, intertwine. We have to make sure the Word of God is in us. All right? It's not just a higher power. I don't even like that word. I like God. It's God in us. Give God the credit. Only God can do that for you. The pulling down of strongholds. Now look at this. Casting down arguments and everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. What does Satan do? God says do this. And what, what does Satan say? Ah, you don't have to do that. Adam and Eve, the perfect example. Every, every Bible character has an example of what not to do. Okay? So it's not like we don't know. It's not like we haven't read it. We have to determine. We have to keep our hearts and our minds clean. We have to turn our will over to God. God, with your help, uh, you know, uh, you know I, I can do this. And it's just like, you know, everybody has something, a struggle that they're going through. And folks, I am telling you, and I believe with all my heart, God can free you from that struggle. He can free you from any addiction. And look, then look at the rest of it, bringing every thought into the captivity to the obedience of Christ. Man, you want to set the bar high? Set the bar high. Every thought. What am I thinking? Every thought into the obedience of Jesus Christ. Now let's finish this up back in Romans. Back in Romans 7. The Bible says, O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Okay, it's almost, you know, uh, like, you know, 
I just, I just feel dead sometimes. I feel like this weight is on me all the time. Paul noticed even the exclamation point there. I, but I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. And folks, the closer you get to Christ, the further you get from sin. That's the bottom line. The closer you get to Christ, the further you get from sin. 1 Corinthians 15, and I'm through. 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 55. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victories? The sting of death is sin. Folks, it hurts you. It stings you. It's wrong. We need to get as far away from sin as we can. And the strength of sin is the law. These do's and don'ts and these regulations, folks, you have to walk in the Spirit, folks. Walking in the Spirit is the key. But look at the next verse, 57. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Folks, we're not walking towards victory. We're walking from victory. As the men sang earlier, it's the cross, folks. The cross gives us victory over sin. Look verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain. Two questions. Number one, do you know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? There are people here that don't know Christ, and that is the reason you can't overcome sin. That is the reason. And I'm not saying, and, and again, folks, if you are convicted about sin, that is a good sign that you are saved. But you have to use spiritual discipline in your life. And as Christians, is there a sin or two that just continue to bombard you? And folks, we can have victory over sin if we will choose a spirit life a spirit-filled world with Bible reading and prayer. Memorizing Scripture helps a lot. It helps a lot. And, and be able to understand Satan wants to trip us up every day of our lives and we don't have to see it. Father, thank You for this day. and God, I thank You for Your Word. God, Your Word is yes, it is true, and it is amen. And God, I know that even in reading this and studying it, the Apostle Paul, just when he was young, just cried out to you. Lord, he fought sin just like we do. And God, I pray that we could have victory over sin today. God, I just pray that we would set the bar high. And God, I pray that we would say no to sin and yes to Jesus. God, I pray if there's one here that doesn't know you, that they would just come forward and just tell us, Man, I need Jesus. I need Jesus in my heart and in my life. Other Christians may need to rededicate their life to Christ. They haven't been doing what they know they need to do. And God, I pray that even as we uh, open this altar up, some would just come to the altar and pray. And still others come for baptism or maybe even church membership. God, this is your church. This is your word. It is your spirit, and only your spirit can draw us closer to you. So, God, I pray that you be with us during this time of invitation. God, I pray that we will totally focus on the invitation, not when we're getting out of here, not where we're going, not anything else. But for these next few minutes, focus on Jesus Christ. And God will give you the glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And amen. If God has spoken to you as you stand to your feet, you come.